Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Computer History Museum. I'm John Holler, the CEO, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight on behalf of our trustees, our staff, our members, our amazing volunteers, all the people involved in making the museum a great place. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight for the kickoff of our Revolutionaries Speaker Series for 2013. We have major funding for the Revolutionary Speaker Series from Intel. We're delighted to have Intel's support for the fourth year running now, and it's just it's fantastic because it enables everything that we do to make these Revolutionaries programs possible. We also get, also get additional funding from the William K. Bose Foundation. I want to say a special thank you to Tesla for arranging to have a Model S here this evening. I hope you had a chance to see the Model S downstairs. We've been looking forward for years to an event when we could have the Motor Trend Car of the Year at the museum, <laughs> and we have it here tonight, so thank you to Tesla. We asked SpaceX for a rocket. <laughs> that proved to be a little more challenging, but maybe someday. And now for tonight's program. Here's a thought exercise. If you compiled a list of the 75 most influential people of the 20th century, who would be on your list? Or if you compiled perhaps a list of the 100 people who most affected the world in the 20th century, who would be on that list? Now, think of the same list that you might start compiling for the 21st century so far. And if all of that proves to be a little too much, I can offer some help. Elon Musk has been on every single one of those lists that has been compiled for the 20th century to date, no matter who seems to be drawing the lists up. Few scientists, entrepreneurs, or industrialists of the last century could stake a claim to a career as boldly ambitious as the one Elon Musk is fashioning now. Transforming a large measure of the world's commerce and payment systems as co-founder and chairman of PayPal in 1999 might be enough for anyone for one lifetime. But Elon Musk has gone on from there to pursue his passion for solving business, environmental, and scientific problems on a global scale. He may be best known for his work at Tesla, where he serves as CEO and head of product design. The path-breaking Tesla Roadster and now the Model S have changed almost all of the assumptions that the automotive world has made about what the styling, performance, and future of a new generation of electric cars might be. Simultaneously, he serves as chairman and principal shareholder of SolarCity, the nation's leading provider of solar power systems. But perhaps his most ambitious and intriguing work is taking place at SpaceX, where he is CEO and chief designer. SpaceX is erasing the boundaries between spaceflight and private enterprise. It has a multi-billion dollar multi-year agreement with NASA to be a workhorse for cargo flights to and from the International Space Station. And in 2015, that is the company's stated goal. It will begin manned spaceflight. What is the source of Elon Musk's revolutionary thinking? How has he been able to do what he's done with the investors he's attracted and the teams that he's built? Exploring these questions and more tonight with Elon is Allison Van Diggelen, who is a very notable and noteworthy journalist here in Silicon Valley, a contributor to KQED and the Huffington Post, and one of the best interviewers in the field through her series, Fresh Dialogues. We're delighted to have Allison here tonight. This is her first time on stage. She's going to be terrific, as will Elon. Please join me in welcoming Elon Musk and Allison Van Diggelen. So I'd like to start. Uh, you grew up in South Africa. Right. And I heard a wonderful story of when you were six years old. And you started breaking the rules even then. So you were six years old, and you were invited by your cousin to a birthday party. But there, was only, there were two problems with that. One, you were grounded. And two, it was on the other side of town. Yeah. So can you explain, tell, tell the audience how you got there? Uh, all right. Well, I mean, I, this was when I was six, so the memories are a little fuzzy at this point. <laughs> um, but um, <clears throat> as I recall, uh, yeah, I, 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 I was grounded for some reason. I don't I didn't know why, but I think I felt that it was unjust. Um, <laughs> 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 and, and, um, and I really wanted to go to my, this party, my cousin's party. Uh, who was five, you know, so this is not a kid's party, but, um, so, uh, I, 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 um, I, at first I was going to take my bike, um, but then, and I told my mom this, um, which is a mistake, 
Um, <laughs> and and, she, and she's, she told me some story about how you needed a license for a bike and the, and the police would stop me. So I wasn't 100% sure if, she was, if that was true or not, <laughs> but I thought I'd better walk just in case. Um, so yeah, just, I, I, I sort of thought I knew the way, and, uh, but it was clear across town. So I don't know, it was 10 or 12 miles away. It's really, really quite far, um, further than I realized actually. And uh, so I just started walking to, to my cousin's house. I think it took me about four hours. And, um, and just as my mom was leaving that party with my brother and sister, she saw me walking down the road um, and freaked out. <laughs> um, and then I, and I, saw, I saw she saw me, so I, I, I then sprinted to my cousin's house, and I was just about two blocks away, and then climbed a tree and refused to come down. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so the first of many rule-breaking adventures guess, for Elon yeah. Musk. So by the, by the time you were 12, you were already an entrepreneur and making a profit. I understand well, you, you, you earned $500 <laughs> equivalent yeah. in Rand uh, for creating a video game. Can you tell us about that and what the inspiration was? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I, uh, when I was about 10, I walked into a computer store in, in, in South Africa and um, saw an actual computer. Um, I previously had um, some, some early sort of precursors to, to the, the Atari uh, system, and then I got the Atari system, which I'm sure a lot of people here have played. Um, and, uh, and, and, but then I saw you could actually have a computer where you could make your own games, and it was a Commodore VIC-20. Um, so that was the first computer I bought, and, um, and, the, and I, then I got some uh, books on how to teach yourself programming, and, um, and this was like the coolest thing um, I'd ever seen, so I was just like, this is super awesome. Um, and uh, so I started pro programming games uh, and, uh, and then selling games in order to actually buy more games. So uh, a, bit of a bit of a circular thing. So, right. or, and more games and better computers and that kind of thing. So, right, yeah. so the money wasn't the, the end goal for you, it was more a means to an end? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, basically I'd spend money on um, yeah, better, better computers and uh, Dungeons and Dragons modules and things like that. <laughs> well, you know, Nerdmaster 3000, basically. Right. Uh, yeah. So I understand at that time you were heavily into comics. I'm curious to know, um, yeah. did you love Iron Man, the comic Iron Man? I, mean, I did kind of like Iron Man, yeah. You did? <laughs> it was, yeah, did you it was ever, good. Did you ever imagine that you would be the inspiration for the movie version? I, I did not. Yes. No. <laughs> that, would, that, was, that, was pretty, that was pretty much... I would say zero percent. I would have said zero percent chance. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of kid were you? I mean, can you can you look back and see yourself? Were you were you a bit of a loner kid, bookish kid? Uh, I certainly I wasn't all that much of a loner. Um, at least uh, not willingly. Um, so, <laughs> um, but but I, I certainly was uh, quite. Um, I was very very bookish. I was reading all the time. So I was either reading, uh, working on my computer, reading comics, playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, that kind of thing. And, um, um, I understand Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that wonderful book by Douglas Adams. That was, yeah. a, that was a key book for you. What, what was it about that book that, that fired your imagination? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess when I was in the, around 12 or 13, I had kind of an existential crisis, and I was reading various books um, on trying to figure out the meaning of life and, well, like, what does it all mean? Because uh, it, it, it it sort of seemed quite meaningless, and then um, uh, my, we happened to have like some, some books by Nietzsche and Schopenhauer in the house, which you should not read at age 14. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> it's really negative. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, but, but then, I, then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was like, quite positive, I think, and, um, uh, and it sort of highlighted the, 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 an important point, which is, that a lot of times the question is harder than the answer. And if you can properly phrase the question, then the answer is the easy part. Nice. Um, and so uh, the, if, to the degree that we can um, better uh, understand the universe, then we know, better know what questions to ask. And um, then whatever the question is that most approx approximates what's the meaning of life, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's the question we could ultimately get closer to understanding. Um, and so I thought, well, to the degree that we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness and, you know, and knowledge, um, human knowledge, then that would be a good thing. Wow. 
Wow, so you're having these deep thoughts at what age, 10, 14? Yeah, sort of in the uh, puberty, I guess. Right. 13, so 13 through 15, probably the most traumatic years. Right, and so by the time you were 17, you were, you were, ready, you were actually left, right? I assume you hatched right. the plan earlier when you were around 15, 14, 15? I, I, did, I did hatch the plan earlier. Actually, I, tr I tried to hatch several plans. Uh, which they did not hatch. <laughs> right. um, but by 17, you were on a plane from South Africa. Yeah. You you'd had enough of South Africa. You were ready to seek new pastures. Now, why was it the United States was your destination? Why not Europe or somewhere else in the world? Well, just whenever I'd read about cool technology, it would tend to be in the United States, you know, uh, or more broadly, North America, or including Canada. So, um, uh, so I kind of wanted to be where the cutting edge of technology was, um, and of course, within the United States, uh, Silicon Valley is, is, the, is where the, the, the heart of things are, uh, is. So, um, although at the time I didn't know where Silicon Valley was. <laughs> it sounded like some mythical place. <laughs> really? um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to come to the, to the US. I tried to convince my, um, my mother or father who were divorced, if either one of them would move to the United States, then I could, then I could get there. At one point, I convinced my father, but then he reneged, unfortunately. Um, so but, you, you had him convinced, and then he changed he, his mind? He did say yes, and then, and then he changed his mind. Why? I don't know. Uh, I, I guess <laughs> um, he, was sort of, he was fairly established. He's an engineer. He was sort of established in South Africa and didn't want to have to go through that again in another country. Right. So you got uh, on that plane all by yourself at 17? Uh, yeah. So um, I, uh, I, I actually got... Um, I, my, my mother was born in Canada, and actually her, her father was uh, American. Uh, but unfortunately, she didn't get her American citizenship, so then that broke the link, and I couldn't get my American citizenship. But she was born in Canada, so I could get, uh, I actually filled out the forms for her and got her Canadian passport, and me too. Um, and then as soon as, within three weeks of my, getting my Canadian passport, I was in Canada. Right. Uh, and then you ended up at the University of Pennsylvania? Yeah, you did I was a degree in, in physics and business? Yeah, so I, I, I was in Canada for, uh, for a few years at uh, Queen's University, got a scholarship to go down to uh, University of Pennsylvania, because um, one of the downsides of, of coming to University of North America was that uh, my, my parents said they would not, would not pay for college if it was, or well, my father said he would not pay for college unless it was in South Africa. So, ah, right. so it was either, so I could have free college in South Africa or, or find some way to pay it here, and uh, fortunately I got a scholarship at, at uh, UPenn and, um, and so did, uh, did he, uh, business, under, a dual undergraduate uh, business and, and physics at UPenn right. Wharton. And it was there that you came up with this idea of three main areas that you felt were most important to humanity. Can you describe how you came upon them? Was it just one day you had a flash of inspiration, these are the three areas that are important and I want to concentrate on? Or how did that, how did that inspiration come to you? No, I think I was thinking about it for a couple of years. Um, and during sort of freshman and sophomore year at Queens and then also in, at, at UPenn. Um, and I was trying to think what, what would most influence the future, uh, you know, what are the problems that we, that we have to solve. Um, and um, and I, I'd actually talked a lot to friends and, and my housemates and that kind of thing, and dates, which was not, maybe not the best thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, actually met, uh, met a woman I, I dated briefly in, in college um, who now works at Scientific American as a writer and, uh, and, and she, she related the anecdote that uh, we went on a date, I was, all I was talking about was electric cars. Uh -huh. um, it, that was not a, big, a winning conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit of a monologue, was it? Yeah, she said, uh, she, she said the first question I asked her was, do you ever think about electric cars? <laughs> <laughs> No, she so never does. So, so you learn from that. That wasn't the best yeah, shout-out was, line. Wasn't wasn't great. That's but great. but it has uh, recently it's been more effective. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> An honest <Yeah>. man. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, we'll get on to Tesla soon. But I want to <laughs> I want to um, go from from University of Pennsylvania. You ended up in Silicon Valley, and you've described Silicon Valley as Darwinian. 
Can you talk about what it in the, was? In a, the most positive sense, really. In the most positive sense. <laughs> I mean, okay. not, yeah. uh, can you elaborate on what that means and why it had to be Silicon Valley? What, what drew you to Silicon Valley? Um, well, uh, well I, I, was at, I was at Penn, and um, there was a professor who, um, who was chairman of a company in Silicon Valley that was working on advanced capacitors for use in electric cars potentially for use in electric cars. Uh, as it turns out, they're, they're way too expensive. But, um, but I thought, well, this is, this is really awesome because then I asked if I could get a summer job because it was in Silicon Valley and working on technology for electric cars. I thought, well, that's, that's pretty much as good as it gets. Um, so I got a summer job uh, here. It was in Los Gatos, actually, um, at, at Pinnacle Research uh, doing... Um, uh, electrolytic uh, ultracapacitors, which were, um, I mean, but they had a, a, the problem was that they, they used a ruthenium tantalum oxide, um, and there was, I think, only a few tons of ruthenium mined in the world, um, so not very scalable. Um, and that, you know, they'd sell it to you by the sort of milligram. So, you know, that's, you know, there's a problem. Um, but, but it had a pretty high energy density. It's sort of roughly equivalent to a lead-acid battery, which for a capacitor is huge. But you ended up then after yep. that at, at Stanford? Yeah, so then um, I, th I thought, well, uh, Stanford is in Silicon Valley, sort of epicenter, and so that's where I wanted to come. Um, either Stanford or Berkeley, and Stanford's sort of sunnier, so I like to. Sunnier, <laughs> that's <laughs> great. And you, I understand you were at Stanford University for a whole two days before you decided, no, it's time, I'm going to do my first startup. Yeah, I figured, well, um, so this was the summer of 95, and, uh, uh, and, and I'd been working on some internet software. So, because the three things I thought would affect the world were the internet, um, sustainable energy, and, and uh, space exploration, making life multiplanetary. So, uh, the, uh, um, but, but on the internet thing, I just couldn't figure out how to make enough money to, to feed myself, you know, because, like, uh, if I didn't, Make, make, make money, then I would like run out of food and die. So that was, that was not good. Uh, so basic uh, needs, so, right? Yeah, literally. Um, so, so whereas, uh, you know, if, if I was a student, then I, I could be a teaching assistant and do, you know, do various things and, and, and do research on um, electric vehicle tech technologies. That, that was my default plan. But, but then I also thought that if I, if I did a PhD at Stanford, then um, I, could, I would spend several years watching the internet go through this incredibly rapid growth phase, and that would be really difficult to, to handle. Like, it's like you really wanted to be doing something. So you saw and, the wave growing. Yeah, it, it sort of really seemed like things were going to take off. Um, although nobody had made any money on the internet at the time. In 95, there was really nobody was making any money on the internet. And in fact, even on Sand Hill Road, people were like, what's the internet? They were, amazingly, um, mm -hmm. when we tried to get funding for a company, and I think it was... November or something of 95, there about October, November, um, more than half of the venture capitalists we met with did not know what the internet was and had not used it. That's amazing. Yeah, literally. I mean, like, far it's like, isn't that, they were literally asking, isn't that something that the government and universities use? I'm like, uh, for now. <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah. Uh, but then, then uh, Netscape went public in late 95, I think it was, and then after that, even though a lot of venture capitalists still didn't understand it and, and still hadn't used it. They, they, somebody had made money on it, so now that... It was on the radar. Yeah, so when right. we went to get funding, the second time we tried to get funding, um, everyone was interested. Right, so this company was Zip2. That's right. And Terrible name. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what was the reason for that name? Um, well, we were just incredibly stupid at the time, I think. <laughs> that was, that's the, the main reason for that name. Um, and because uh, we, we, we got some ad agency, because we thought, well, we don't know anything about names, so we'll get some ad agencies to suggest a bunch of options, and then Zip2 seemed kind of speedy. I don't know what the hell, what, why the hell we chose that <laughs> stupid name. <laughs> um, and it has a digit in it. It's like, why would you pick it? Because it could be Zip T O, it could be Zip T W O, it could be Zip T O O. So like people like <laughs> literally spelled the name every variation. Uh, which is bad if you go to URL and you don't have the other ones. Uh, so, so, um, so Zip2 started off um, as basically 
uh, like I said, we're trying to figure out how to, how to make enough money to exist as a company. And the, so, so since there wasn't really any advertising money being made, uh, we thought we could um, help existing companies get online, bring their stuff online. So we, we developed software that helped bring um, a lot of the newspapers and media companies online, because a lot of them just didn't, they also didn't know what the internet was. You had or, some big customers, didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even the ones that were aware of the internet didn't have a software team, so they, they weren't very good at developing functionality. Um, and uh, so we had, as um, investors and customers, uh, the New York Times company, Knight Ritter, Hearst, mm -hmm. and, and so we were able to get them to pay us to develop software for them to bring them online, so online publishing stuff. And we did maps and directions and yellow pages and white pages and uh, various other things. Um, and uh, we, we developed quite sophisticated technology, actually, but um, I, I, it, it wasn't actually being employed super well by the media companies. Like we, we would suggest ways to use it, and then it would not be used as effectively as it could be. It was very frustrating. Right, but you did sell that company successfully to Compaq. Yeah. Right, and that allowed you to go on and uh, create X.com. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, the uh, yeah, Compaq had uh, had AltaVista. So their their thought was to combine AltaVista and a bunch of other technology companies and see if that would if that would work, which it did not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but but nonetheless, they 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 were pretty nice guys and bought the company and. And that gave me the capital to, to do another company. And I want, I want to do another company in the internet because I, I thought we hadn't really reached the potential that we could have with Civ2. With because um, we, we had really sophisticated software. I mean, our, our software was sort of at least comparable to what Yahoo or Excite or others had. In fact, I mean, I thought in some ways it was better. So, uh, I, but it wasn't, be, because it was all filtered through these partners, it wasn't getting properly used. Right. Uh, so I thought, well, um, I want to do something that could be more, a more significant contribu contribution to the internet, and right. um, and so the initial thought was, was financial services because um, money is digital, um, it's low bandwidth. At the time, there was, you know, most people were on modems, uh, right. still on modems, and because um, this was uh, late '98, early '99. So this was X.com was a precursor to PayPal, basically. That's right. Yeah. Right? You merged with Confinity. And it became PayPal major success. Yeah, it, so it worked out better than we expected. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Confinity. So initially, Confinity and X.com started out with, from slightly different directions and then converged to the same point. Um, with with X, the thought was to create an integrated set of financial services, um, so you'd, you could go to one place and do all of your financial anything. Um, and, and then as a feature, we had the ability to transfer money or securities or anything simply by entering, entering a unique identifier. So like a, a, you know email address or phone number or something like that. Right. Um, and uh, when we would demo the system, the hard stuff, which was the integration of all the financial services, uh, people would not be interested in. But they'd be really interested in, it, in being able to transfer money using an email address, right. even though that was actually quite easy. Um, and so we focused our, our energy on that. Um, and although it's easy in principle, it, uh, what gets really hard is, is adding um, security while still keeping it easy to use. That right. was, yeah. So, because, you know, it's like the Willie Lerman quote, like, why do people, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. So, mm -hmm. why do people rob PayPal? <laughs> Same reason. Right. Um, and, and, and so, you can, either, you can dial up the security to a really high level, but then you're going to make it very hard to use. Um, and, and so, that, 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 was, that was one of the toughest things we, we, we wrestled with. Um, and then Confinity originally started as kind of um, software for Palm Pilots. And, and then they had a demonstration application, which was the ability to beam money from one Palm Pilot to another using the infrared port. <laughs> People remember that one. Yes. Um, that was big at one point. Um, and, and then they, they had a website uh, sort of parallel to that, where you, because once you'd beamed the infrared tokens, you had to still then um, synchronize your uh, Palm Pilot and uh, do the transfer via the website. So, uh, uh, but then people weren't that interested in the Palm Pilot stuff, but they were interested in the website. And so we kind of converged to the same point, um, and we're quite close together. So we, we, we decided to merge the companies um, and, uh, in, I think, January or so of 2000. 
it was a very turbulent period. <laughs> um, and if, if the, the, the growth in the company was, was pretty, pretty crazy. Mm. Like we had, at, at the end of the first sort of four or five weeks, we had 100,000 customers. It's incredible. Yeah. Incredible growth. Um, did you anticipate that when you started out? Definitely did not. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and it wasn't all good because uh, we had some bugs in the software. Mm. Uh, and, you know, what, even if the bug only occurs one in a thousand times, it's still, right, if you, and you have a hundred thousand like customers, that. you have a hundred yes. very angry customers. Like, where's my money? That would be, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, a, re a, reasonable, a reasonable concern that people would have. And, and then we... We, we had customer service on University and Avenue in Palo Alto. Uh, there were five people. Um, so when something went wrong, customer service phones would basically explode. Oh, my goodness. Um, and uh, so we had, we had many challenges, and then the various financial regulatory agencies were trying to shut us down. Visa and MasterCard were trying to shut us down. eBay was trying to shut us down. Uh, FTC was trying to shut us down. Um, there were a lot of battles there. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's quite incredible with all that adversity you, you conquered, and you came out with several yeah, that was, hundred million, right? Yeah, it was a close call. Um, mm -hmm. We definitely, I mean, came very close to dying there in 2000 and 2001. Um, and what was the reason for that success? What would you put it down to in that case? How did you overcome? Uh, well, you know, I think we had a really talented group of people at PayPal. Um, and a lot of those people have actually gone on to start many other companies. Yes. Um, you know, YouTube, LinkedIn, Yelp, mm -hmm. uh, Yammer. Um, it's like quite a long list, actually. Um, and so for you personally, there you were with several hundred million. Were you not tempted just to go and buy an island? <laughs> <laughs> um, not well, really. What was it that uh, drove you? What I'm getting at, because I, I know you didn't. But sure. What I'm getting at is why were you so driven to jump into the next thing? Well, I was... Um, did you take any time off? I, I did take a bit of time off uh, because um, after PayPal, um, I did reasonably well for PayPal. I was the largest shareholder in the company, so, um, and we were acquired for I think about a billion and a half in stock, and then the stock doubled. So... Mm -hmm. um, so you know, did, did reasonably, did reasonably well, but the, the idea of, of like lying on a beach as my main thing mm -hmm. uh, just sounds like the worst. That sounds horrible to me. Mm -hmm. uh, just because the boredom factor. I would go bonkers. I would, mm -hmm. you know, um, I would have to be on serious drugs. I mean, I, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> you know. or serious pina coladas. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. I mean, it, it just, I'd be super duper bored. Um, so that, uh, I mean, I like, I like high intensity. Um, I mean, I like going to the beach for a short period of time, uh, but, but not much longer than like, you know, a few days or something like that. Right, so let's so, talk about the seeds uh, of SpaceX. I understand it started not as the idea of a let's, let's start a rocket ship company. Uh, you had a philanthropic idea. You were really surprised when you found out that NASA didn't have any plans to go to Mars. And you yes. came up with this idea of, let's put a greenhouse on Mars. So can you e explain how that whole idea came into being for, for SpaceX? Sure. Well, um, so, so when I was thinking of like, what I thought would, would affect the world uh, as a student, it wasn't really from the standpoint of those are the things I'll get involved in. It was kind of more in the abstract. These are the things I think will happen that will affect the world, um, but, but not that I will be involved in them. As it turns out, I have, but uh, I always thought that we would make much more progress in space, um, and it just it just didn't happen. It was it was really disappointing. So, um, uh, yeah, I was I was just really quite bothered by it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when, when we went to the moon, um, we were supposed to have a base on the moon. We we're supposed to send people to Mars, and that stuff just. It just didn't happen. It, it, we went backwards. Um, and, and, you know, we got the space shuttle, but the space shuttle could only go to low Earth orbit, where Saturn V could go to the moon. Now the space shuttle's gone. And so that just seemed like a, a really bad thing. So uh, I thought, um, well, maybe it was a question of, of um, there not being enough attention or will to, to do this. 
Um, but this, I, this, was, was, this was a wrong assumption. So, I, I, um, so but that, that's the reason for the greenhouse idea. It was to, the thought was if, if, um, if there could be sort of a, a small philanthropic mission to Mars, you know, so I was, I was expecting to lose all, all the money that I invested in, in, in that. Um, but if we could send a small greenhouse to the surface of Mars with, with seeds in, in dehydrated nutrient gel and you hydrated upon landing and you'd have this great shot of you know, little greenhouse with, with little green plants with, on, on a red background, um, I thought that would get people excited. So you literally imagined a photograph inspiring and you yeah, generated. Yeah, you gotta sort of imagine the money shot, if you will. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I think I think you know, the green plants and red background would be that. Um, and and people tend to get interested and excited about precedents and superlatives. So this would be the furthest that life's ever traveled, the f the first life on Mars, um, as far as we know. Um, and uh, and I thought, well, maybe that would result in in a in a bigger budget for NASA and and. Um, and then we could sort of resume the journey. Mm -hmm. That was the basic idea. And I, and I, I spent a, several months on this, actually, and, and uh, went to Russia three times, because um, I, I was able to, to figure out how to get the cost of the spacecraft low and the communications and the, 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 the greenhouse and all that to, to a reasonable number, reasonable meaning several million dollars. Um, and did, you have, did you actually physically draw out a greenhouse of how you imagine. Yeah, we have, yeah. I, actually, I hope we've got that somewhere. Um, That'd be amazing to see. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm sure it looks pretty goofy in retrospect, but, but that's, the, that's the idea that we had. And, it, um, so, and I, I spent several hundred thousand dollars just kind of getting the design worked out and engaging some companies to um, come up with the design specifications for the subsystems. Um, and, uh, and then, but then it came to buying the rocket, and the problem was that the, the cost of rockets is really high. Uh, and the lowest cost rocket in the US at the time was the, uh, the Delta II, uh, Boeing's Delta II, and, and that would have been about $50 million. Um, wow. Yeah, and then you'd need, still need to have it like an upper stage from Mars, so probably 60 million all in. And that was, uh, and I wanted to do two of these missions because I thought if if it just did just one and, and it didn't work, then that could have a, like the net, the opposite of effect. Well, like, look how dumb it is to do thing, to to try to right. send things to Mars. Look at all this money down the drain. Yeah, right. what an idiot. <laughs> so, so I wanted to do two, and I just didn't have enough money to do, to do two complete missions. Um, right. So you had a budget of about a hundred million, something like that. Well, I was hoping it would be less than that, but. Uh, but not more. I mean, mm -hmm. not more than that. Um, but th but then, yeah. That, I guess roughly on that order is, is about most. I'd be. I, I, I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't spend much more than that. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Um, anyways, so the Russians didn't help you out. Yeah, three three quite interesting trips to Russia to try to uh, negotiate purchase of two Russian ICBMs. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yeah. And did they think you had evil intent? No, they just thought I was crazy. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's not good either, uh, if you're buying ICBMs. Um, uh, but minus the nuke. I mean, I think that would have been a lot more. <laughs> uh, so. so you didn't talk nukes to No, I, I mean, I didn't. I, mean, I got, slightly got the feeling that that was on the table, if I, <laughs> <laughs> which, which was a very alarming. Um, <laughs> But, but uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, those were very weird meetings um, with, with the, the, the Russian uh, military and whatnot. Um, I mean, I think they, they, they thought I was a bit crazy, but then they, thought, they, they read about PayPal and said, okay, he was crazy, but he's got money. Uh, <laughs> he did something right. Yeah, well, and more importantly, I could pay them. Um, right, yes. yes. So, so that's, that's really, I mean, they, yeah, it was remarkably capitalist was, was my impression. Of the Russians. Yeah. Right. Right, um, I have heard that before. Yep. Um, so tell me, how, what was the turning point from you know, talking with the Russians and then deciding, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to set up a company. What was that turning point for you? Well, um, I, I, I guess I, 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 had, I came to the conclusion that um, my initial premise was, was wrong. Uh, that, in fact, 
the, um, th there's, there's a great deal of will. Uh, you know, the, the, there, there's, there's not such a shortage. Um, but people don't think there's a way. Um, and, and that if people thought there was, there was a way, or at least something that wouldn't you know, break the federal budget, um, then, th then people would, would support it. Um, which in retrospect I think is actually kind of obvious because um, the, the United States is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, people came here from other places. Um, I mean, it's, you know, th th there's no nation, there's no, I mean, there's no nation that, that's more a nation of explorers than the United, the United States, but, but people need to believe that it's possible and it's, that it's not, you know, it's, they're not gonna have to give up like healthcare or something important. <laughs> right. you know, it's just, it's gotta be, that, 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 that's important. So, so I thought, okay, well, then it's not a question of will, it's, it's a question of showing that there's a way. Um, and, and, the, and I started reading quite a bit about rockets to try to understand why they're so, so freaking expensive. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, is there something, you know, where does this, the $60 million go for the Delta II? Um, and that subsequently, now Delta II, I think is $100, $100 million or something, even some cra crazy number. Um, and Delta II is, I mean, that's a relatively small rocket. Um, so if you go to like a really, you know, one of the bigger rockets, it's anywhere from 200 to 400 million dollars. Um, anyway, so, so I came to the conclusion that there, there wasn't really a good reason for rockets to be so expensive. Um, and, and, and that there they could be a lot less. And e even in ex an expendable format, uh, there could be less. And, uh, and, and that in, if one could make them reusable, like airplanes, then the cost of rocketry would, go, would drop dramatically. The cost of space travel would drop dramatically because the, the cost of the fuel was maybe anywhere from 0.2 to 0.5% of the cost of the rocket. Right. Um, you know, it's kind of like a plane. I mean, how much is the cost of the fuel in the plane versus the, the plane itself? Mm -hmm. It's a, at least a two order of magnitude difference. Um, but nobody had really been able to make a reusable rocket work so that, uh, that, but I, so I thought, okay, that if we can do that, then that would, that would really be the, the key breakthrough for space travel. Right, but you um, also said that- So far we have not succeeded, I should point out. <laughs> um, you've also said that failure was the most likely outcome. Can you talk about failure in that sense and in a broader sense of being an entrepreneur and an innovator? Why is failure so important? Uh, well, I, don't, I mean, I, I, think, I think failure is bad. Um, I don't think it's good, um, mm -hmm. but if, if, if something's important enough, then you, you do it even though the risk of failure is high. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think my advice if somebody is in, wants to start a company is they should bear in mind that the most likely outcome is, is that it's not gonna work. And they should reconcile themselves to that pos strong possibility. Um, and it's, they should only do it if they feel that they, they're, they are really compelled to do it, you know? Right. Um, because it's, it's, it's gonna, the, the way starting a company works is like, usually in the beginning, it's, the very beginning, it's kind of fun, um, and then it's really hellish for, for a number of years. You talked about chewing glass. Yeah, there's, there's a, fr a friend of mine who's a successful entrepreneur, um, and uh, started actually his career around the same time as I did, and he, he has a good, good, good phrase, his name's Bully. Uh, um, he said, yeah, you know, starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Um, and, and you agree with that? Generally true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, 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 and if you don't eat the glass, you're not going to be successful. That's, that's yeah, tough medicine. Tough yeah. medicine. So let's move along. Uh, we're going to get down into <laughs> innovation and motivation shortly, but I want to just go through your whole business career first. So shortly after founding SpaceX, you then got interested in electric vehicles. And I understand you watched the vigils yeah. for the death of the EV-1 when they were all smashed. Talk about that and, and why you felt even after founding SpaceX, I have to get involved with Tesla. Yeah, um, well, uh, as I said, like my interest in electric vehicles goes back a long time to, you know, Goes back 20 right, plus the years. Dating scene. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, the, the original reason I came to Silicon Valley was to work on electric vehicle energy storage technology. Right. Um, 
And, and I, I, I thought that, um, that the big car companies would develop electric cars, because obviously the right move. Um, and, 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 and I thought that was vindicated when General Motors and uh, Toyota announced their, you know, General Motors was doing the EV1, the electric vehicle one, Toyota did the electric RAV4, the original one, um, and, and they made those announcements and then and they brought those to market and I thought, okay, well, this is, this is great. Um, you know, we're gonna have electric cars, GM's gonna obviously do the EV2 and three and then you know, they just get, keep getting better and everything would be cool. Um, and, uh, and then uh, when, when California relaxed its regulations on electric cars, GM recalled all of the EV1s uh, and crushed them into little cubes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which is, seems kind of nutty. Mm -hmm. um, so, in, in fact, uh, the, the people didn't want their EV1s recalled. Yeah. And in fact, they, they, tried, they tried court orders to stop the cars from being recalled. They, they held a candlelit vigil, okay, at the, the yard where the cars were crushed. Did now, you attend that vigil? No, I, I, did, I did not. I you're, did not moved, uh, you're moved by it. Well, certainly. I mean, yeah. it's, it's crazy. If, if, I mean, when is the last time you heard about any company customers holding a candlelit vigil for the demise of that, that product? Mm -hmm. um, Particularly a GM product. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, what bigger wake-up call do you need? It's like, it's like, hello, the customers are really upset about this. <laughs> they would really prefer it if it didn't get recalled. Um, so so that, that, that kind of blew my mind. So it was like, wow, okay. Um, and, and, then, uh, and, then we, and then we had the advent of lithium-ion batteries, which really helps, helps the, it makes, you know, that's, that's one of the key things for making electric cars work. It's still nothing. And so um, in 2003, I uh, actually had lunch with one of the other co-founders of the company, J.B. Stravel, who um, was actually working, I think, on like a hydrogen airplane or something. Um, and um, he mentioned to me uh, the uh, T0 car that was done by AC Propulsion. Um, AC Propulsion, I think, consists of guys some of whom had actually been on the EV1 program. And they, uh, they took an, uh, a gasoline uh, sports car, kind of a kit car, and outfitted it with, uh, with lithium-ion batteries, sort of consumer-grade cells. And they um, uh, created a, a car which is, which is essentially the precursor of the Roadster. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and in fact, it had very similar specifications. Um, so sub-zero, sub-four-second, zero to 60 miles an hour, um, 250 mile range, and um, also a two-seater sort of sports car. Uh, but, but, it had, it, but it was quite primitive. Um, it didn't have a roof, one thing, at all. Um, and um, in fact, I don't know if it had doors. Uh, but it didn't have any safety systems, no airbags. It wasn't homologated, so you couldn't sell it. Um, so in order to sell that car, in order to create a commercial version of the car, something that a manufacturer could produce and sell to people, there was a fair bit of work that was required. And, uh, but anyway, I kept trying to get AC Propulsion to commercialize the, the, the T0. And I said, look, I'm gonna, I'll fund the whole effort. Can, you, know, you really need to do this. Um, and they, they, just, they just sort of refused to do it. Um, they didn't want to do it. They, they wanted to make, uh, I think, at the, What's that? Uh, they want to make like an electric Scion, um, which in principle sounds good, except that it would have cost seventy five thousand mm dollars, -hmm. and nobody wants to buy a seventy five thousand dollars Scion. Um, and and uh, the, the technology just was not ready. There, there was just no way to to make a, um, a, a good value for money proposition. Um, and what, was it, like a what was it that compelled you to say, I have to be CEO here and lead this company? Why not say, you know, I'll help you, JB, get this, get this rolling? Well, I really didn't want to be CEO of two companies. Mm -hmm. uh, if I tried to really hard not to be, actually. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, anyway, so AC Repulsion finally said, okay, I, I, I actually told AC Repulsion, look, if you're not going to do this, I'm going to create a company to, to do this. Um, and they said, well, there's some other guys who are also interested in doing that. Um, and 
you guys should combine efforts and, and, and create a company. Um, and that's basically how Tesla uh, came together. Um, and, uh, and then we had like a lot of drama. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but I mean, I, I had, um, since I was the, you know, I provided like 95% of the money, so I could have been the CEO from day one, but I really, you know, the idea of being CEO of two startups at the same time was not uh, appealing, and shouldn't be appealing, by the way, if anyone's thinking that's a good idea. <laughs> it's a really terrible yes. idea. But then, again, you know, going back to your um, trajectory here, not only did you take on two, you took on three. You had a, an epiphany at Burning Man, I understand, and decided... You have to watch no, those I epiphanies, watch... Burning Man. <laughs> not necessarily what you should pursue. Um, <laughs> and you yeah, came up with the idea. There, so. um, it, yeah, it's... it's uh, well, um, you know, this, solar is kind of part of the whole sustainable energy thing. So. Mm -hmm. Sustainable energy, you have to have sustainable means of, of producing and consuming en uh, energy. And so even if you have electric cars, you have to have the other side of the equation, say, how do you produce energy in a sustainable way? Um, and I think solar is the obvious primary means of sustainable energy generation. Uh, in fact, the Earth is almost entirely solar powered today. Um, the, the, uh, the, you know, the only reason we're not a frozen ice ball at sort of three degrees Kelvin is because of the sun. And, and the sun is responsible for all precipitation. It's, it's responsible for the vast majority of the ecosystem, apart from sort of chemotrophs at the bottom of the ocean. So uh, the, 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 there's just a tiny amount of energy that people, that people consume to, to power civilization. It's actually a very tiny amount of energy relative to the amount of energy that the sun sends in our general direction. Um, and so in order to deal with that, we, we couldn't, in fact, power the entire world with solar power quite easily. This is maybe not super obvious to people. But. So was that the epiphany you had at Burning Man? Was it a oh, vision? No, I, no, I knew that long, long I knew that in college. But, but what, what was the, the key vision that came to you at Burning Man? <laughs> we all want to imagine you there. The vision? <laughs> um, the, uh, no, it was, it was more... Um, the, the, uh, I wouldn't say it was a, a particular epiphany. It was more that I was at Burning Man with, um, with, with my cousins, or two of my cousins, uh, Lyndon, yeah, Lyndon and Peter. Lyndon and Peter Rive, mm -hmm. uh, who are awesome guys. And they, and, I, and, and they were sort of trying to think, what should they do after their, um, after their first startup? So they did a company called Everdream, which did... Um, large-scale management of, com of computers. So if you've got like 60,000 computers, it's kind of hard to manage them. So they wrote this, they created software that enables people, uh, companies to do that. Right. Um, and that company actually got sold to Dell. Uh, um, so they were looking for a new venture and yeah. looking for your ideas? Well, I wouldn't say they were initially looking for my ideas, but I, I actually was trying to convince them that they should do solar. Um, uh, and uh, because I just, thought, I just thought it was an area that needed people like them. Uh, here are really good, good entrepreneurs. So, uh, and and since I was like somewhat overcommitted, I thought <laughs> to say um, the least. Yeah, uh, I thought well, and, and I said like, look, if if you guys will will do a solar company, I'll I'll find you, you know, provide all the funding and uh, you know whatever guidance I can or help I can provide, uh, I, I I do that. And that, that's and I thought it was really important that there be. Uh, you know, good entrepreneurs like them in, in solar, solar because it just wasn't, wasn't doing very well as an industry. So, um, and I thought people were kind of focusing on not the, they weren't focusing on the right problem. Um, the, everybody sort of thought that the, uh, the panel was the problem, but actually it's, it's, not, it's, it's a problem, but it's not, it's not, the, it's not the most important problem. Um, it's the and and the, the panel is somewhat commoditized at this point. So it's right. you know making fifth standard efficiency solar panels is about as hard as making drywall. It's really easy. In fact, I'd say drywall is probably harder. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but but what what is a thorny problem is trying to figure out how to get um, solar on 
tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of rooftops. Right, the logistics part. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of like you've got to re-roof um, mm -hmm. millions of buildings. Um, and, and then figure out how the grid interconnects work and then manage all those systems. Like, so if you've got hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of systems eventually, you've got to manage all these distributed systems. You have this really complex distributed utility effectively, um, which I think actually plays to, to their strengths in creating, uh, their price strength in creating uh, really scalable s software for managing you know, hundreds of thousands of computers um, in a distributed fashion. Right. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's kind of what they did. And they're, it's an awesome job. It was just, like I basically would show up at the board meetings to hear the, what's the good news this time. You know, it's like, really, you know. We had like maybe a couple of bad news board meetings. Well, in late 2008, there were some bad news board, meeting, board meetings. But um, for the most part, apart from a few, a few times when the macroeconomic conditions were really terrible, um, they just did an amazing job with you know, almost no help from me. So you've been able to leave it in their good hands. Yeah, it's, right. uh, okay. they deserve the vast majority of the credit for, for the success of that company. Awesome. So I'd like to move on to innovation and motivation. There's been a lot of talk lately about the fact that innovation is leveling off. We're not making the dramatic increases or improvements in innovation like we did when the plane was that. invented. Do you, yeah. do you agree with that? And uh, no, I don't agree with that. I don't think mm -hmm. that's true. Um, okay. uh, I think we've, we've seen well, and I'm not sure of what time period that is exactly, but I mean, we've, we've seen um, huge improvements in, um, the, in the internet and new, new things. Uh, I mean, in, in, you know, in the recent years, Twitter and Facebook being, being pretty huge when people kind of thought the internet was done. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think that there are some of the things that we're doing, like, like you know, electric cars are, are a new thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, mean, I, I, really, I do think there's, there's some pretty significant breakthroughs. I mean, in genomics, um, mm -hmm. we're getting better and better at decoding genomes and, and being able to write genetics. I think that's going to be a huge, huge area. I think there's likely to be some breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. Um, and um, I suspect we will even see the flying car. Is that, is that going to be an Elon Musk production? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to let someone else do that? Uh, yeah, I, well, I think someone else, I think someone else is doing that. All right. Okay, well, that's another conversation. Do you feel uh, the government is standing in the way of innovation at all? Well, sometimes um, the government, I don't, I don't think the government intends to stand in the way of innovation, but sometimes it can overregulate industries to the point where innovation becomes very difficult. Right. Um, I mean, in the, the, the auto industry used to be a great hotbed of innovation, at the beginning of the 20th century, but, uh, but now there's so many regulations that are intended to protect consumers. Um, I mean, the, the body of regulation for cars could like fill you know, this room. It's just crazy how much uh, regulation there is, and down to like what the, ta the, the headlamps are supposed to be like, and uh, the, they even specify the use, some of the elements of the user interface on the dashboard, which, and some of these are completely anachronistic. Because um, they're, they're, they're relating back to the days when you had like a little light that would illuminate a, an image. Um, so like we have to reserve space on the instrument panel of the Model S for where all of the, the indicators like th th that a car would have. You know, you've got the, like these little lights like... Check engine the, or whatever? Yeah, or like all right. these little, little things. There's like a whole bunch of them and we can't have anything else in that space. Like, uh, well, how about if we have one space and render a different graphic? Like, oh no, because people are expecting to see it in that space. I'm like, nobody is expecting to see it in that space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you feel you can argue with these regulations, you just have to. Well, you can point. argue with them, but not with great success. Uh, <laughs> and and, and you, you can actually get these things changed, but it takes ages. Right. Um, like, one of the things we're trying to get is like, like, why should you have side mirrors if you can have say, little video cameras, tiny video cameras, and have them you know, display an image inside the car. Right. Um, but there are all these regulations saying you have to have side mirrors. And I went and met with the Secretary of Transport, like, can you change this regulation? Still nothing has happened. That was like two years ago. Um, 
you know. So you're banging your head against a wall here a little bit. It's not easy to get yeah. these regulations changed. So talking of government, uh, President Obama is obviously trying to do what he can. If you had five minutes with President Obama, what would you advise him for, one, stimulating the economy and, and entrepreneurship and creating jobs? Is there one thing that if he could successfully get through that would be a big stimulus, do you think? Well, I think actually, um, I, I think the reality of being president is that you're actually like the captain of a very huge ship and have a small rudder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, because obviously, if, I mean, if, if there was a button that a president could push that said economic prosperity, you'd be like, they're hitting that button real fast. Mm, full steam ahead, yeah. <laughs> you could measure the speed of light by how fast they measure, they press that button. Because that would be, that's called the, like the re-election button. Um, so, so, that, so that I'm, I'm not sure how much the president can really do, but, um, but I think, I think uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm generally a fan of like minimal government interference in the economy. Um, like the government should be kind of a, like the referee, but not the player. Um, and there shouldn't be too many referees. <laughs> right. um, but but, but uh, um, there is an exception, which is when there's uh, an unpriced externality, um, such as the CO2 capacity of the oceans and atmosphere. Right. So when you have an unpriced externality, then the normal market mechanisms do not work. And then govern it's government's role to, to intervene in a, in a way that's sensible. Um, and the best way to intervene is to, is to put, is to assign a proper price to whatever the, 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 the common good is that's being consumed. Um, and then, and then, so you're saying there should be a tax on gas? There should be a tax on carbon. But, you know, right. if, the, if the bad thing is uh, carbon accumulation in the atmosphere, then there needs to be a tax on, on that. Um, and then we can, that, that will, and, and then you can get rid of all subsidies and all everything else. Um, and it seems like logical that you should tax things that are, that are most likely to be bad rather than, you know, if, like, if, like that's why we tax cigarettes and alcohol. Um, because those, those are probably bad for you. Um, certainly cigarettes are. Um, and <laughs> um, so, so, uh, yeah, so, so you want to err on the side of taxing things that are probably bad and, and not tax things that are, that are good. Uh, and so I think it, given that there is a need to gather tax for the, um, you know, to pay for the federal government, we should shift the tax burden to, to bad things, and then adjust that, that tax of that bad thing according to whatever is going to result in, in, in the behavior that we think is beneficial for the future. I mean, I, I think currently that you know, what we're doing right now, which is mining and burning trillions of tons of hydrocarbons that, that used to be buried very deep underground, and now we're sticking them in the atmosphere and running this crazy chemical experiment on the atmosphere. Um, and then you've got the oil and gas companies, which have ungodly amounts of money. Um, and you can't expect them to just roll over and die. Like, they don't do that. Um, so, th actually, what they much prefer to do is spend uh, you know, enormous amounts of money lobbying and running bogus ad campaigns and that kind of thing to preserve their, their situation. Mm. Um, you know, it's, like, it's a lot like uh, tobacco companies in the old days. I mean, they used to run these ads with doctors, like a well, guy with a doctor, you know, with a, pretending he's a doctor, uh, you know, if, essentially implying that smoking is good for you. Right. And like having pregnant mothers on ads smoking. Um, Do you have a message for the climate change skeptics and and the the big oil people? Well, as far as climate change skeptic, I mean, like I'm, you know, I, I like to, I believe in the scientific method, and one should be, one should have a healthy skepticism of things in general, and you know, as if if you approach things from a scientific standpoint, you always look at things probabilistically, not definitively, and so I think a lot. A lot of times, if, if somebody's a skeptic in the science community, what they're really saying is that they're not sure that it's 100% certain that, right. that this is the case. But that's, that's, that's not the point. The point is um, that is, 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 is to look at it from the other side. See, what, what do you think the percentage chance is of, of this being catastrophic for some meaningful percentage of the Earth's population? Um, is it greater than 1%? Is it even 1%? Um, if it is even 1%, why are we running this experiment? Right, because you called it a Russian roulette. We're playing Russian roulette with the atmosphere. We're playing Russian roulette, and then and, and as each year goes by, we're loading more rounds in the chamber. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
not, it's not wise. Um, so, so that's, and, and, and what makes it super insane is that we're gonna run out of oil anyway. <laughs> like, it's not like there's some infinite oil supply. We're gonna run out of it. So we know we have to get to a sustainable means of, of, of transportation no matter what. So why even run the experiment? Right. It's the world's dumbest experiment. Right. Yeah. So let's move on to focus on Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs is, was and is a wonderful Silicon Valley icon. Is he someone that you've admired and what have you learned from Steve's life and work? Uh, <clears throat> well, he's certainly someone I've, I've admired. Um, well, I, I did try to talk to him once at a party and he was super rude to me. Uh, <laughs> But I don't think it was me. I think it was sort of, you know, pop the think, course. I think you weren't the first. Yeah, not the first, no. It was, um, but, but uh, yeah, and I was actually there with, like, Larry Page is an old friend of mine. I've known Larry since before he got venture funding for Google. And Larry was the guy that introduced me to Steve Jobs. So it's not as like I'm, I'm going, like, and tugging on his coat, like, you know, please talk to me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so it was introduced by Larry Page. It's not bad. So, um, but, uh, I mean, he obviously was an incredible guy and, and made fantastic products uh, that, that um, you know, and, and I don't know, there was like a, uh, a certain, um, the guy had a certain magic about him, you know, just sort of, that was kind of, that was really inspiring. So, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's really great. Is there, a, is there that magic that you try and emulate? Uh, no, I, I think uh, Steve Jobs is way cooler than, than I am, so. <laughs> uh. Okay. So I'd like to get inside your head a little bit about, you know, when you come up with an idea, do you doodle it, you know, on a pad of paper, or do you get your iPad out and, and take notes? I mean, when you come up with something new, you know, a new rocket design or whatever it is, how does that manifest itself? Could we see you um, being creative? Um, I mean, it's somewhat cliched, but it's, it happens a lot in the shower. Um, I don't know what it is about showers or... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get the camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, yay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I'm just, uh, no, I do. I just sort of kind of stand there in the shower. Um, so you have long showers? I do, actually, yeah. Less. <laughs> <laughs> long showers. Sounds wrong. Um, but, yeah, I do. Um, and, so there's and no iPad course, in not, the shower, right? Not to mention right? the Burning Man epiphanies. Um, right. But those are those are huge. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's. Uh, yeah, and and, and then um, there there are sometimes like late at night uh, if I've been thinking about something, then I can't sleep and I'll be up for, you know, and, uh, for, for several hours, um, thinking about sort of pacing around the house and thinking about things and. Um, Occasionally, I'll, I'll sketch something or send myself an email or something like that. Right. So we have a question from the audience. Um, who inspires you, or do you have a mentor? Um, well, um, I, I don't have a mentor per se, although I try to, I try to get feedback from as many people as possible. Um, and um, so I have, I have like friends, and I ask them to, you know, what they think of this, that, that, and the other thing, and. Um, you know, as mentioned, you know, Larry's a good, Larry Page is a good friend of mine, value his advice a lot, um, and um, I have many other good friends, and uh, so, so I think it's good to solicit feedback, uh, and particularly negative feedback, actually, because, you know, obviously people aren't, don't love the idea of giving you negative feedback, um, unless, unless it, it's like some, you know, on, on, on uh, blogs, they, they do that. Um, yeah, how do you deal with negative feedback? Because you've got some tough... Um, criticism, especially with SpaceX. You had incumbents like Neil Armstrong even uh, speaking out and saying, yeah, this is weird. wrong, we don't want you know, commercial yeah. companies in space, it's not a place for co commerce. So how did yeah. you deal with that? And how do you well, deal with you know, naysayers uh, in general? Because you've had a lot. Yeah, that was kind of troubling, because uh, uh, you know, growing up, Neil Armstrong was kind of a hero, so it's like, mm. it kind of sucks to, yeah. you know. Like, Kn knife in the a, back. That's right. a bit of a blow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I, th I think in his case he was somewhat manipulated, you know, by by other interests. So I don't think he quite knew what he was saying in those in those congressional hearings. So yeah. Right. Okay. 
Okay. And um, talk about, you know, it's one thing to have these wonderful ideas in the shower at Burning Man, but it's another thing to <laughs> build, motivate, and retain a team of excellent people. Can you talk about some tips and some things you've learned that obviously work for you? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if you think about a company, a company is, is a group of people that are organized to create a product or service. That's, uh, that's what a company is. So in order to um, create such a thing, you have to convince others to join you in, in your effort. Um, and, and, and so they have to be convinced that, that, that it's a sensible thing, that, uh, it's like, that there's at least some, some, good, some reasonable chance of success. Uh, and if, if there is success, that the reward will be commensurate with the effort involved. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I think that's getting people to, to believe in what you're doing uh, and in, in you is, is, is important. Um, so in, in the beginning, there will be, there will be uh, few people who, who, do, who believe in you or in, in what you're doing. Um, and, uh, but then over time, as you make progress, that the evidence will build and, and more and more people will believe in, in what you're doing. So um, I think it's a good idea when creating a company to, um, to create it, to have a demonstration or you know, to, if, if it's a product to have like a, a, a good mock-up or if it's, even if it's, if it's software to have good demo wear or to be able to sketch something so that people can really envision what it's about. Um, like that, that's a, try to get to that point as soon as possible and then Iterate to make it as as real as possible, as fast as possible. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. But. Okay, so you're running, you're CEO of two companies, you're chairman of Solar City. Talk about time management. How on earth do you do this? Well, do you get any sleep? Uh, so, yeah, sometimes not enough. Sleep is is really great because uh, because if you, I find if I don't get enough sleep, then I'm I'm quite grumpy. Um, I mean, obviously, I think most people are that way. Um, and, and, and also, um, like I try to sort of figure out what's the right amount of sleep, because I, I found I could have, the, I could drop below a certain threshold of sleep, and although I'd be awake more hours and I could sustain it, I would get less done because um, my, my mental acuity would be affected. Um, so I found generally the right number for me is around six to six and a half hours on average per night. Um, that's not too bad. Yeah. Right. And any other tips that is on... That's an average, though. <laughs> right. Any other tips on, on just managing to run two companies simultaneously? I mean, do you, do you find... I mean, I know you're up here <clears throat> Monday, Tuesday. Is it all Tesla when you're up in Silicon Valley and all SpaceX well, Wednesday, Thursday? It, 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 uh, having, a, sort of a, a, um, having a smartphone is incredibly helpful because that means you can do email during... Um, interstitial periods, like if you're in a car, you're walking in the bathroom everywhere, you, know, you can do email practically when you're awake. Um, and uh, and so, so that's really helpful to have email for SpaceX and, and Tesla integrated on, on my phone. Um, and then, uh, and, and then it's just you have to apply a lot of hours to actual working, actually working. So the, the way I generally do it is I'll be uh, working at SpaceX on Monday, and then Monday night fly to the Bay Area, uh, spent Tuesday and Wednesday at the Bay Area, then at, at Tesla, and then fly back on Wednesday night, spend Thursday and Friday at SpaceX. Um, in, in, in the last several months, then I, I would fly back here on a Saturday um, and either spend Saturday and Sunday at Tesla uh, or spend Saturday at Tesla and Sunday at SpaceX. Um, <laughs> and, where, and where do the so, boys fit in? You have five sons. Um, yeah. <laughs> do I, they, I kinda, do they tag along with dad on some of these they, they, trips? I do drag them along on a lot of things, actually. Um, they're remarkably unimpressed by... <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I wish they would be sort of more interested. But I mean, they're only, the twins are, are eight and the triplets are six, so maybe they'll get more, more interested later. But, do you see one day grooming one of them or several of them to take over your companies? Well, I, I mean, I think if, if, if they're inclined to, I mean, if they're really interested in working at, at Tesla or SpaceX, then I, I you know, I'd help them do that. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to 
necessarily try to insert them into the CEO role at some point. You know, it, it's kind of like if if uh, if the rest of the team and the board kind of felt that they were the right person, then that would be that would be fine. But uh, I wouldn't want people to feel like I would kind of in, you know installed Confusing. you know right. my my kid there. Um, and I don't think that would be good for either the, the companies or the kid really. Um, uh, but but I have I, 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 I was actually at one point of a school of thought that. Um, you know, it's best to give away kind of like 99% or more of one's assets, uh, kind of like the Buffett school of thought. Buffett, right. And mm -hmm. um, I'm still mostly of that, inclined in that direction, but after seeing what happened with Ford and GM and Chrysler, where GM and Chrysler went, went bankrupt, but Ford d did not, mm -hmm. and, and Ford seemed to make better long-term choices than, than the other two companies, and that's in part because of the influence of the Ford family um, and I thought, well, okay, th there may be some merit in having some longer-term family ownership, at least at least a portion of it, so it, it's, right. it acts as a positive influence. Uh, I mean, it's, this is still something I'm thinking about, but acting as a positive influence in, in the long term, so the company kind of does does proper long-term things. Um, and like, I'm, you know, if look, if look at what happened also in, in, in Silicon Valley with with HP. I mean, I think it's quite 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 sad. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, and that, that that to some degree is because there was um, much diminished uh, influence by the, the the Hewlett and Packard families. Right. Um, so I think they should have prevailed in, in, in their you know in, where they were opposed to the the merger that took place at one mm. point, and I think they were right actually. Right. And keep it, and looking to the future for SpaceX. Yeah. Is there an IPO plan for this year? No, there's no IPO plan. No. Um, I'd say running a public company does, is, does have its drawbacks. Um, so you're not in a hurry? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, in the case of Tesla and SpaceX, uh, we, we had to raise capital, um, and, and we had kind of a complex equity structure that needed to be resolved by, by going public. Um, and um, and so so I thought we, we kind of needed to do that in those two cases. We don't have to do that in SpaceX. I think, I think there's a good chance we will at some point in the future. But but SpaceX's objectives are, are super long term, and and the market is is not. So I'm a bit worried that if we did go public, certainly if we went public too soon, that it the, the, that market pressure would would force us to do. Uh, short-term things and abandon right. kind of long-term projects. Like uh, going to Mars. Right, going to Mars, very long-term. Yes, that's an important one. So you do have other projects on the back burner. You've talked about the Hyperloop, uh, yeah. <laughs> a way of getting people from downtown LA to downtown San Francisco in under half an hour, an electric supersonic airplane. Yeah. Which of those two are bubbling up that we might hear more about in the near future? <clears throat> well, I, I did promise that I'd, I'd um, do some paper on the on the hyperloop idea, um, and uh, things got a little a little hectic towards the end of last year because uh, I had I had these I'd committed to, to make these milestones at, at Tesla to to the public markets, and um, I had to stay true to that obligation, um, which required just a just an insane level of work and attention. Um, and uh, and then we also had the Solar City IPO, right, which was a, a very difficult IPO to to get done. Um, and that IPO occurred just by the skin of its teeth. I mean, it was so so uh, such a tough one. Were you just determined it had to be in December? Well, um, if it wasn't in December, it would mean pushing it out, you know, quite a bit. Um, and. Uh, and the problem is that we'd already pushed it out quite a bit. So if we didn't go public, we'd have to do a private round, mm -hmm. and then um, and, and it just the whole thing wouldn't feel right. You know, it's like you're sitting at the it's like you're, you're you know at the at the altar and you don't do the do the wedding. It's like well, it's a bit awkward. You know? uh, um, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so we really need we really needed to do it, um, and and. Uh, and I think if we hadn't done it, people would have looked at it as a failure, and it wouldn't have been good. 
because there's just been too many failures in the solar, or, or too many, not enough success, let's say, in the solar yeah. arena. Right. They needed to be sort of, we need to chalk up the success. In yeah, the it was arena. a rare piece of sunshine for the solar <laughs> right. industry last exactly. year, that's for but sure. Ironically, for a solar industry, does not have a lot of yes. that. Yes, yes. So it's time, unfortunately, for our last question. You've come a long way since you were that six-year-old little boy breaking the rules. Um, you turned 42 this year. Right. What is on the cards? Where do, you, where do you see yourself in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 40 years' time? Because you famously said you want to die on Mars, just not on impact. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Tell us about that dream. Um, yeah. Well, I actually was asked by a journalist, do you want to die on Mars? And I said, yes. And I was like, but wait, not on impact, not impact yeah, just to be clear. <laughs> 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 That's one of the possibilities. Um, so, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, uh, I guess, um, I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to be able to go to Mars while I'm still able to manage the journey reasonably well. So I think, like, I don't want to be, like, 75 and go to Mars. You don't uh, want to take your Zimmer frame with you. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it, it, it could be, at least in the beginning, it could be, you know, mildly arduous. So... Um, wanted to. I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to get there. Um, I don't know. I mean, ideally in my fifties, that would be. That would be kind of cool. So you see that happening in the next. Well, I mean, I, I aspire to make that happen, and I I can see the potential for that happening, um, and um, uh, I'm not saying it will happen, but I I I I think it can happen. Um, I'll try to make it happen. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, Elon Musk.